Russia's world on subjects which are the companies and the models of Hi, I'm Ben Lurchin. And I'm Elaviv Newton. And this is an interview for Believe the Hype, currently exhibiting at Babe Lab Gallery in Oakland, California. So Ben, could you tell me about the work you're exhibiting right now? Yeah, I mean, very simply put, it's a big red button that uh, tweets fake news. It generates it based on an algorithm called Markup Chains that's able to input um, you know, anywhere from like a thousand to, in this case, 10,000 to like millions of small bits of text and uh, imitate them. So it's all about fake things, specifically fake news. Um, what insights have you gleaned from creating this piece and, and seeing the, the tweets you're scraping using your code? Um, I've learned a lot about how easy it is to make a conspiracy theory accusation hmm. um, that even a bot can do it. Like really even all you can do is like put a bunch of words together that like sound like they mean something and suddenly you're like, well, what does Obama have to do with uh, you know, asteroids. Right. Do you think any believable conspiracy theories have been created through your, your Twitter bot? Like, believable or believed? Uh, that's a really good question. Why don't you tell me? <laughs> I'm not sure about <laughs> believed yet, but I'm hoping the bot will get some traction outside of the show, and, and who knows then. Yeah, how, people, how have people been reacting to the bot on Twitter? I, I believe it just went live as the show debuted, correct? Right, yeah. We, um, it has a few followers. I'm hoping that'll grow. Mm -hmm. um, there is a pastor following it. There's um, a pastor following it. Where's I don't the know if he's a real pastor. He could be a fake pastor. Uh, it would be fitting for a fake news bot. Yeah, I mean, I followed like a lot of random accounts as the bot, um, mm -hmm. so people respond differently. Uh, one of those people actually tried to ban the uh, bot. They reported it to Twitter, and uh, at that point, it was still mentioning people. So uh, wow. Twitter took it down, and uh, now it's back up, so it's all good. How did you get it back up after Twitter took it down? Um, they just like took off right privileges, so I was able to like change the way it was authenticating and just put it back up. Wonderful. And are you going to keep running with this Twitter bot for the future as we know it, or is this just a part of the exhibition? Uh, I'm not sure really what the life will be. I think it will probably stop tweeting after the exhibition, and mm -hmm. uh, there could be another event that causes it to tweet again, but we'll Very see. Cool. Yeah, I've loved the tweets. Um, most of them are hilarious. Uh, as you keep pressing the button, a new tweet is created and it's being sent out into the world. So it's live tweeting in accordance with how the public is interacting with it. And how does the how does the bot create these these new sentences, these new ideas? Does it scrape all of the uh, tweets that are out in the public that are using the hashtag fake? How does that mechanism work? Yeah, so I mean, it's, understand? it's a fact. Uh, essentially something I do uh, manually, um, I pull down, you know, about 10,000 tweets like in one day uh, that have been, you know, anything with the hashtag fake. So it could be about fake news, it could be about fake friends, it could be about fake boobs. Um, and th to the bot, they're really all the same thing, although a lot of it these days is about fake news. Um, and uh, it uses an algorithm called Markov Chains, which is a probabilistic algorithm for predicting like what word is going to come next in a sequence of words. Um, so it comes up with pretty ridiculous uh, juxtapositions of like different types of things it might be talking about. Yeah. Um, reading all the tweets that it's sending out, you get a really good reading of like the kind of language and even the tone that, that people are using on Twitter. Yeah. So there's like a lot of all caps messages and it sounds like people are yelling and arguing and lots of arguments are happening. Do you think that's a fair representation of the Twitter universe and the actual human conversations that it's relying on to make its new tweets? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the important parts of the project, actually, is that it um, allows you to sort of grasp a huge volume of messaging that's taking place, maybe not in the network of people that you would want to follow necessarily, or that you do, um, or that you know enough to like look for that account, um, and you get like a sort of almost a gestalt of like the tweets that people are sending through this bot that can like parse um, hundreds of thousands of 
like words in a you know wow. millisecond. Is that how many? Is that the volume of tweets it's looking through? Hundreds of thousands? It's not quite hundreds of thousands. I'm hoping to get it there as I like add more during the course of the exhibition. Right mm -hmm. now, I think it's operating on about ten thousand tweets. Oh my gosh! And is it live? Is it is it scraping as we speak? It's not. I have to filter out a lot of porn, and I also filter out things that are um, not in English. But that's the only mm -hmm. editorial uh, sort of uh, criteria that I have. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, that takes me like all night. And uh, so I've only done it once, I'm gonna okay. do like one or two more data dumps. So there's actually like a lot of physical, mental labor involved in running a Twitter bot this yeah. successful. Yeah, I mean there's sort of this almost emotional labor of like, oh that's uh, that's porn, that's not porn, like, uh, and it's not too, super hard, like, spend enough time on the internet, but like, <laughs> um, it's still like labor that humans are really good at and machines aren't yet. Absolutely. Um, do you think there's anything surprising this Twitter bot has taught you in creating it and seeing such a huge segment of the Twitter universe being served to you like this? Um, I think I've like been fairly aware of the dynamics of like what what fake Twitter looks like. Um, I've been surprised just to sort of see people's reactions to pushing the button. They're just like, oh, like, oh, that's a thing. It's very tactile. It's very refreshing. You feel like you've control over something that um, feels completely out of our hands. Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. And that's Ben Lurchin for Believe the Hype. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lucia Goodbag. I am a fiber artist based in Oakland. Um, my work, I attempt to uh, both be contrarian to the nature of fibers and do stuff with it that is unexpected. Um, I oftentimes try to give physical space to the digital realms that we spend so much time in. Um, and I feel like fabric is a really great textual way to do that. Absolutely. I'm Ella Viv Newton. Again, this is Believe the Hype, an exhibition currently happening at Babe Lab Gallery in Oakland, which I hope you'll visit. Uh, Lucia, would you tell me more about the piece you have installed? You responded to the open call we had mm -hmm. on the website. And uh, can you tell us the title of your piece and what it comprises? Yeah, so the title of my piece is Alternative Facts. And I have had this nebulous idea floating around in my brain for a while about the American identity and how it is so linked to the end of World War II. So what we're taught in school is that it was our atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that ended the, the World War II and because of our great act of heroism that we have uh, become this great force for good, fighting for freedom and democracy throughout the world and that makes us inherently good and well-meaning no matter mm -hmm. what uses of force that we have to undertake and that I believe is wholly untrue that World War II ended because of the Soviets being able to focus their attention on Japan not our, uh, our campaign there so I tried to start there and also bring in other um, simplified new media narratives of what justified extreme use of force throughout history and current events and then try to look into the future and how that could be used. Yeah, wonderful. Um, you go from World War II mm -hmm. to the invasion of Iraq under George Bush II and then you go into North Korea and then finally Syria and then a future conception of a, a possible invasion of Yemen someday. Why did you choose Yemen? Um, Yemen, I believe, is a conflict which we have been involved in by uh, not only just refueling Saudi jets, 
but selling them billions of dollars worth of weapons in order to really terrorize the Yemeni people. And this is a conflict that we as Americans generally know very little about. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the Saudis are our allies and we want to support them in maintaining peace and stability in the Middle East, but I think that it's a much more complicated story than that. And uh, right now, Yemen is going through an intense humanitarian crisis, not just the famine that has come from um, essentially a blockade by the Saudis and the inability for them to grow food, but now there is a crazy cholera epidemic that is sweeping through there. And wow. that's it's amazing how time. this is happening. And it's impossible to even keep track of this or I feel yeah. guilty for not knowing this but it's also not in the mainstream news it's not it's yeah. and it, it takes it's an incredible undertaking on top of just working and existing and maintaining social relationships to do this daily work of keeping up and so with my piece I wanted to present simultaneously how much work how difficult how overwhelming and anxiety causing mm -hmm. this process is but also it exists the information is there um, mm -hmm. it's not a fruitless quest mm -hmm. you'll find it it just takes some work yeah. and it's a very painful process learning about all this stuff um, and realizing all the pain that people are going through, but I think it's incredibly necessary that we do this because the goal is for us to try to eventually end that pain. Hmm. Can we talk about the design of the physical piece itself? So the, the piece has two layers um, for the five different countries that it talks about in relation to America. It has a sheer sort of iPhone screen shaped a uh, curtain that you have to push across to see all of the data you research, which is represented as a sort of panoply of different uh, web browser windows that you can't read any full window. Mm -hmm. They're all sort of like uh, stacked on each other. So you're seeing clips of information. It really, it shows the amount, the depth of your research and it shows like how overwhelming so much of this information really appears for anyone even just starting out. And it, I think it also beautifully crystallizes the feeling of like going into an internet spiral and, and, mm -hmm. and spending hours researching something that you never even realized there was so much information about. So can you talk about you know, the significance of using fabric to represent this digital interaction, mm -hmm. as well as, as the two layers that compose this piece? Mm -hmm. um, well, with most of my work, I feel like presenting these very um, inhuman feeling digital spaces on fabric gives it a level of tangibility where we feel um, oftentimes I'll, I'll use apparel or I, I've worked with quilting or flag making to try to give a more human feel to these spaces because in essence they are humans, right? It's a bunch of humans interacting, it just doesn't feel that way, which I think is part of the reason why we're in this situation where um, the dialogue over the internet can be difficult to have. Um, because we're not seeing the humans that we're having it with. Mm -hmm. um, but the juxtaposition of the simplified curtain over the chaotic uh, browser windows is trying to mimic what it feels like to attempt to see beyond the simplified narrative that we're given in like the mainstream media. Because generally, in most mainstream outlets, there's one or two, you know, given left or right leaning, you know, narratives that we're told, this is what's happening in this conflict, but when you try to research an aspect of it, it can become this entire thing. And I think we're all very familiar with that experience of having just like so many tabs open right. in your internet browser, you can't even read what they say anymore. Yeah. And you're like, I want to read this later, but you never get back to it. Yeah. It's so easy to just abandon it, mm -hmm. but it was like a nice <coughs> um, So it was like a nice <coughs> <coughs> Go Do you want any water? Are you good? Getting over a cold. Oh, okay, no worries. We, we are, um, we're just, and we'll, just, we'll, cut, we'll cut to the next. Like, yeah, I have one more question for you. Unless you okay. can think of something else you want to talk about, which I'm no. very happy to do so. Do you have any words of wisdom after doing all this phenomenal, heartbreaking research, which so many of us are so hesitant to delve into, for people who want to learn more and, and become independent discoverers of, of data? And we have all this wealth of resources, as some other pieces in the exhibition demonstrate, we can't always trust the first thing we find on the internet. So 
what did you find as good strategies and, and, and learning techniques looking so deeply into these issues? Mm -hmm. um, I, in order to understand these issues, I found a documentary series that kind of pieced together like the untold pieces of the American history. Mm -hmm. And so that, while I didn't want to get all of my information from that, it was a really good foundation. And so I highly recommend trying to find something like that, that is just like so a gives you like an overview. broad, exactly, um, overview of these subjects. And then you can begin to pull in more specific pieces. Um, and I also couldn't have done it without certain friends who were willing to point me towards different resources and okay. also just talk about it and answer my questions and help me find some more solid footing as to the things I wanted to know. Um, and as I said before, even though it feels like it's so much work, it's so overwhelming, it's so painful, it is. and it might feel like it will be fruitless in the end, I don't believe that it is. I think that knowing about other people's experiences is only can only bring positive things. So just okay. remembering that when you're going through that process. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you for curing. Of course, my pleasure. All right, that concludes. Are we good? Is that good? Yeah. No, you good. gave the most poignant, elegant, <laughs> beautiful, fucking thoughtful <laughs> answers I've ever heard in my life. Like, I just revolutionized my life. Oh my god. <laughs> Thanks. Wow. I think a lot. That's good. I'm glad <laughs> someone is. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's really wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's like, yeah, it's really scary to go into those that information because it feels fake close. It feels mm -hmm. like my country, which I belong to, which I never elected to belong to, has done irrevocable harm against mm -hmm. other people. And I have to carry that weight. And what will learning about it really do to help yeah. things? But actually, it's like the more informed you are of, of the past, the less likely you are to repeat the mistakes of the future. Exactly. The more informed you are when you're protesting and objecting to contemporary actions. Absolutely. It's so important. And also, you know, how similarly these things repeat, how, you know, with what's happening in Syria right now, which we talked about the other night, which mm -hmm. is so incredibly complicated, it can't be sure. like distilled into one or two sentences, but the language that was used about Assad, specific quotes like him being a butcher, the exact ones that they were used against Saddam Hussein, you know? So once you are aware of these things, then you are able to ask questions about current events that are important in order to form conclusions about what's going on, or at least not form conclusions, right? Like. People tell us, the media tells us, like, this is what's happening, this is what we're doing, this is exactly what's going on, and I think that we need to suspend judgment a little bit more. For I absolutely agree with that, and I think your art contributes hugely to that step that we need to take as a society. So I'm very grateful for you to be showing it in this exhibition. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It came together so well. It looks uh, yeah. so good. I'm very happy. I think I think There's all the work. a lot of people here that I didn't expect I to see. I know. <laughs> it's like so busy. I can't even get through the show. I'm just like stopping. I'll just watch from the sidelines. But yeah, it's good. Oh my god. Wonderful. Are we good? Yeah. Cool. All right. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I'm Ella Viv Newton and... I'm Caroline Sinders. And we are talking right now about Believe the Hype, currently on view in Oakland. Uh, can you introduce me to your piece? Sure. So, um, my piece called Things Are Really Binary is a series of five participatory posters mm -hmm. where uh, um, I guess the audience is invited to write on them. I will be writing on them and annotating them. So I've been making these posters since the, the, the election and I'm gonna continue making them for the next couple of years. Um, so they're about the emergence of the alt-right hmm. and looking at the like divisions inside of American politics right now as the left continues to like move away from I think like general liberalism, um, 
pondering like where where do moderates sit what is the true center right now and looking at the rise of far-right extremism mm. and sort of like taking a snapshot from like an ethnographer standpoint but also as like a critical designer of like looking at the state of american politics absolutely so I understand that you were part of a fellowship that gave you six months to specifically research this entire forum. So do you think the alt-right is a recent phenomenon or is it a rebranding of an older sort of presence? Well, actually, my fellowship is a year long. Um, mm -hmm. I, I happened to start in October and I was, I applied with this provocation of what is, how, how can you use machine learning to mitigate online harassment and the state of online harassment and digital harassment really changed with the election. Uh, one thing I had noticed mm. leading up to the election was different um, different forms of conflict really emerging inside of spaces like Twitter between uh, different people or different ideologies in politics. So mm -hmm. people were saying, oh, I'm being censored because someone doesn't like my political stance. And someone else mm -hmm. was saying like, oh, I'm actually like harassed because this person is hiding behind their politics. And I was thinking about how that actually really complicates like what is harassment, for example. Like sure. we all know politics is politically charged, right? Not even, sorry, not even politically charged, like hypercharged, emotionally charged. Sure. It enters a highly contentious zone pretty quickly. Though I think Generally, the idea is like, yeah, politics is conflict ridden. Conflict is different than abuse. Conflict is different than harassment. But what I sort of started to see was like specific um, proponents, you know, all across the political spectrum, actually engaging in harassment and then saying like, well, no, this is just political disagreement. This is just ideological disagreement. We're actually what, just. What would that look like? Just if you could give me a really um, quick example. Yeah, an example could be like. Um, a conservative writer particularly going after a liberal writer and then quote tweeting them and saying like this person reported me to Twitter hmm. because of my politics and then like the followers of that but going after would be I'm assuming inclusive of a harassment sort yeah. of activity so or it could even just be um, like a false statement like oh this person must have reported me to Twitter because they're a snowflake that can't handle our political disagreement when in fact it could be like well no you doggedly followed this other person into their mentions you wouldn't leave them alone for days like that is actually harassment you know like that isn't a good faith argument you're not trying to get a good quote you're not actually trying to engage in debate you're trying to like work someone into a frenzy to get a reaction that seems um like an overreaction and then you're using the overreaction as proof to show to your followers who are politically charged that you're being censored and so people want to be censored then somehow well I don't think it's that they want to be censored they want they want a reason to create a campaign so they yeah so they don't want to be censored what they want is it it's like give me a reason to start a fight is what it is okay. give me a reason to engage in this targeted campaign to show that I'm a victim like that's what it is people want to actually like show that they are in some way being hurt for their politics. And you see this also on the left as well. Like you'll see mm -hmm. people particularly go after conservatives. Like it's like kicking a beehive almost. And I was gonna ask if this happened on both sides of the it's totally spectrum. Yeah. Because it doesn't seem like it, it is isolated from what I see. It's, yeah. it's, it's across the spectrum because what, what you actually have is people with really big followers that like want a platform. They also like want, I think, what I think is relevancy. Mm -hmm. So you'll see people like go and start things where you're like, you shouldn't tweet at Milo Yiannopoulos. Like you shouldn't do that. You know he's gonna come after you. Right. And that sounds incredibly like leading and victim blaming and I don't mean it to be. What I mean is it's more like um, if you if you go to a space and you know it's already contentious and you create a form of contention, the qu bigger question is when you start to study online harassment is, is that harassment or are you baiting someone? Hmm. And I think that that's true in politics where it's like, okay, like we're in a space where it's hyper amplified. If you have more than like 5,000 follow followers, like you're entering a space where it's highly contentious. And so it's much harder to say, is this harassment or not? If you're both like if the two parties engaging in harassment are on different political spectrums, right? Like it's actually a lot harder for researchers. It's harder for people that work at the, at the like social network companies. It's harder for people writing policy for social networks to say like, I actually don't know if it's harassment or not because you're both ideologically opposed to each other hmm. and you're not engaging in things that we can easily see as harassment, such as like threats or slurs. Hmm. So 
like that's where it gets really compl complex and complicated. It makes you wonder if like what our definitions of harassment are need to yeah. be updated somehow. Totally. Well, I also, I mean, I think it's hard because like uh, a part of what I study is digital protest. So like if you update harassment to like mitigate politicized conflict, does this in some way limit protest under authoritarian regimes? Like if you look at like Erdogan, who's the dictator of Turkey and like blocking Twitter and say of Turkey, um, could he use a policy on Facebook to force a reveal of like different political protesters who are, who are, who are protesting his regime? So that's where it gets really complicated. And that's mm -hmm. why these, like that's why these spaces are so conflicted and so complicated because I actually don't have a good answer like I don't know necessarily how you would go about starting to solve this this is where the project comes from and that's why it's really participatory based it's, it works with an audience sure. because I have a lot of questions I want to work out with people yeah it's wonderful so one of the uh, transparencies reads that the moderate the moderate voice in America isn't actually in the middle yeah could you tell me a little bit more about that? Totally. I mean, I think we have this common idea of it being yeah. like the sort of like basic, sort of fair-minded, balanced point of view. But when you look at your map, you have like alt-right on the far right, obviously, and then the liberal spectrum is actually like just a fraction of that entire sort of landscape. Yeah. yeah. I would say this is really like a reaction to the current regime we're under, hmm. which is like you know we just pull out the Paris Accord, right? right. So like. That isn't a moderate statement. So right now it's like the view of centrism and like how to be central and neutral or moderate isn't in the middle anymore. It's actually, I think like in liberalism, which is like a form of the left. Like that's the most, like, like liberalism is the most conservative view of like leftist politics. And like the actual mm. true center isn't really in the center of this graph. It's really more towards the left. It's also too where I think that like we view things as binary and they're not binary. They're incredibly complex, which is why the title of the piece, yeah, things, things are, are rarely binary. binary. Yeah. Um, because it's also more of a thing to sort of show like how things have shifted and articulate like where I think as an ethnographer and artist, we sit politically and I'm going based off one people's reactions to the current like presidential r regime for lack yeah. of a better word that we have but administration also yeah administration yeah. but also then like the reaction that exists from like i'm from new orleans so a lot of confederate statues were just taken down and when i was right. when i was home over memorial day a lot of people were protesting with confederate flags um, so they were like surrounding these, which are these public circles that cars drive around and people walk around and they were like openly protesting and like had large Confederate flags. They had like large Trump Pence um, flags. I heard one guy shot to a man on a motorcycle who looked, um, he was like a person of color and was like, go home, like leave America. And this guy turns to him on his motorcycle and says like, I feel sad for y'all. And like the assumption was because you're not white, you don't belong here, which is also crazy because like white people only got here from like getting on ships. Like yeah. it's not, yeah. like yeah. that's like, but what I also found fascinating was like this space that we're in, like, you know, the, our, like the United States didn't look this way four years ago. Like hmm. there's a lot of, I think, extreme behavior that's incredibly emboldened right now. And I think that we can't ignore that. I don't think that that's just randomly occurring. I think that that um, emboldened behavior is, because of this administration. So I think it's mm. important to acknowledge that like, if that's the kind of protest that sort of exists like on the conservative side of politics, like what does that mean for a center? Like what is a center if it is- The center's right wing now yeah. is what it looks like yeah. to me. So like- And you not know, necessarily like the edge of right wing, yeah. but maybe more even inward than that. Right, and, and it's kind of hard to say like, what is, what is like, what is like center or moderate when like, mm. you know, like, um, like Mitt Romney was coming out against Donald Trump, like he was considered such a conservative. Right. And now he's considered like a voice of reason. His right. politics haven't changed in <laughs> like four years, yeah. but like the way we relate to him has changed in four years. Yeah. Like he hasn't changed or necessarily evolved politically as a country, the way we relate to him and the way that like the media represents him has changed because of Trump. Yeah. And I don't think we can ignore that anymore. Yeah, those are all wonderful points. Um, can we talk about the, the pieces that you totally. you submitted to our open call? We accepted. I, I read it and was blown away instantly, by the way. Um, it was perfect for the show. It is perfect for the show. 
it's kind of provoking exactly the conversation I, I was hoping to have through this show. Um, so there are a series of five transparencies, mm -hmm. and each is printed. And tonight, of course, yet to see, but we're going to see you do some activation with, with markers and using the audience. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about like the process of creating these transparent protest posters is how yeah. you describe them. I've, I've never seen or heard anything like that before. Where did this idea come from? Um, I was thinking a lot about, so I, I with this fellowship, um, I've, I've been, I have a dual fellowship between BuzzFeed, a journalistic news site, mm -hmm. and IBM, a creative arts and technology center in New York. And I was thinking about how do I like take all this ethnography I've been doing and really make sense of like this community. So I started drawing diagrams and I showed some of them to ProPublica. Um, I've been working on a data set with them and they were like, this actually logically makes a lot of sense. And I'm like, well, this is just like how I'm trying to suss out what's happening. And the thing I was sort of struck with is it's like, these are like small snapshots of where the community is. But like, if I show them separately as like singular posters, people sort of take these as like, this is everything. And they're not, everything's constantly in flux. Right. And I was like, how do I sort of show that? And I was like, well, ideally like a book, for example, you'd have to lift the pages up. And I was like, the problem with like lifting pages up is you can't see the page before or after, you know, you can only like look at singular pages unless like, or there's two here, right? Yeah. But I was like, I want every layer to be together. Um, and I was actually really influenced by the work of Daniel Ezzo, who's a photographer that does a lot of work playing around the future of imaging and retouching. So she'll retouch images to be what is considered like classically beautiful for the photography industry and then delete the image underneath. So all you see are like the retouches she's done. Right. So she's created these amazing spaces that feel like 3D spaces. And she started to play with these by like printing them in resin so you can see all the like actual layers she's made in Photoshop. Wow. And wow. so I was thinking about how Danielle was really able to like um, like capitalize and really visually and viscerally play with ideas of layers by like physically making layers. And I was thinking about how like layered politics are and so I sort of took a note out of that and was like what if I actually made transparencies where you were forced to look at all of them but to actually like really sit with all the different layers you have to touch them and like work through them. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, I think your piece is really powerful to me because after Trump won, it was like being estranged from my own country. I felt completely out of touch. And I still do, and, and a lot of the show is like, I think me and my community and yeah. everyone I've spoken to trying to resolve that, that feeling of estrangement and getting to know better what is the state of politics, how it, it seems radically new. It does, and a lot of it is the internet, a lot of it is this sort of incendiary speech. We, we are encouraged to do this, to, to rise up in a stream of so many voices yeah. via Twitter or even Facebook. Um, and I feel like your piece really speaks to that. So thank, thank you, you yeah. for bringing it to the yeah. show. It's amazing. Thank yeah, you. I'm excited to be included. Yeah, cool. Awesome. All right, do you want me to ask you anything else? Yeah, that, that sounds good. Okay, awesome. those are really fun. Yeah, yeah thank okay. you. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, everybody. So, um, Carolyn Slanders is now going to do a performance with a piece that she. Um, responded to the open call for the show with, which is called um, uh, Things Are Rarely Binary. And a brief introduction, Caroline uh, spent six months, actually a year, oh, you're an introduction of the Soul Society? Okay, well then everyone please direct your attention to lovely Caroline Sanders. Right. So, lots of people these are designed to be participatory posters. Um, I have markers, so you're welcome to, throughout the course of the evening, write on these. Um, these are snapshots into this sort of evolving and sort of shifting uh, digital landscape of the alt-right. And what I mean by shifting and evolving is like language changes over time and like groups on the internet are not static, they're constantly shifting, like their values are shifting, what is popular is shifting inside these spaces. Um, for the past couple years I've been studying protest as well as online harassment inside digital spaces and uh, with the election I started focusing specifically on the alt-right and less on like general online harassment. So what these are is this is from the last six months I've spent uh, reading neo-Nazi blogs. Um, you can laugh because it's awful. <laughs> Um, Neo-Nazi blogs, 4chan, 8chan, Vote, which is a Reddit clone as well as Reddit, specifically focusing on spaces that uh, the alt-right congregates in. And I've uh, been partnering with the Southern Poverty Law Center to look at different slices of when is the alt-right. So I've been studying white supremacy, white nationalism, and neo-Nazism. Um, so these are 
diagrams I made to try to situate and figure out like what the spaces um, of the alt-right were in relation to like American politics. Um, so this first one, for example, is where I see American politics right now. Um, this is not done to like size of like tweets. It's done to like size of idea. So I'm trying to figure out how to write on this while I'm sitting in front of everyone. So not number of social posts, size of idea. Um, So this may actually change in six months. And my hypothesis about what this could be is this one right back here. So I often wonder um, the validity of this one, for example. Um, so while, or today I was reading Richard Spencer's Twitter account, as one does. Um, and I noticed that he was talking about different hashtags in relationship to the news. So one thing he tweeted in response to Louisiana taking down different um, Confederacy statues was this hashtag called Heritage Not Hate. What I'm writing is it's not alt-right, but it is representative of racist ideology. Um, so a lot of these are also trying to, like, these annotations are trying to slice into what these different things mean and how they can be related to a bigger idea, but they're not actually just one-to-one um, -one the alt-right. These things are constantly shifting. Things are very complicated. The, the whole piece is called Things Are Really Binary Because Politics Are Not So Flat. Um, it's neither like bad or good. It's there's so many slices of what racism can look like, as well as what white supremacy is. Um, I encourage all of you to draw on them. If you have questions, if you have thoughts or provocations, these are in fact designed to be drawn all over by everyone. So I'm gonna start with Sergey, because you're my friend. Draw or write or anything? Either or. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? I'm a little confused about something you just said. Yeah. You said, um, you know, something about how this isn't binary or good or bad, but it's about, then you said you're studying like white supremacy. Right. So I'm a little confused because so, like, supremacy, white supremacy is bad. Right. But they're, but like, what I mean by that is it's neither like, there's like a line between good and bad. Mm -hmm. It's like much more complicated. Sure. And it's complicated in the sense of how does digital language exist. Yeah. And so like what where this gets hard is how do you determine like who is a white nationalist? Okay. You kind of can't do that from just the language they're using. Gotcha. And so this is trying to like create a space of conversation of like how do you deal with the sort of violent language when right. we can't say like, oh if you use one of these hashtags, you're a white supremacist. Well, thank you, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Totally. Do you engage with any of these directly or do you just uh, observe? Not yet. Um, when I was studying Gamergate, I would engage with them directly, but this is a bit more highly charged than Gamergate. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's something where eventually I'm hoping to get into that space, but I also feel like with this, for example, you actually don't really need to. Much like you read, they put everything out there for you to see. A lot of these terms, um, like these hashtags and terms are drawn specifically from indoctrination guides that um, different spaces put out. So like the Daily Stormer and Neo-Nazi blog has a guide for indoctrinating what they, who they call normies yeah. into their space. 
So that's, that's interesting because some of the stuff borderlines on harassment, right? Uh, when we get to that space. And that, yeah. I mean, I think to the question earlier about how this intervention happens in that space, it's like, have you uh, been working with, um, like, say, Twitter or Facebook directly to uh, then control this information or at least flag yeah. uh, potentially hate uh, speech? No, but I've created an open source database, which I've like shared with ProPublica. I'm actually working on a large scale like um, guide for them right now. But with Facebook and Twitter, I worked with some of them on how to think about harassment. Uh, this is a much harder thing for them to engage with, in a sense, because it borders into political ideology, and that's something that they actually don't want to touch. I mean, that's really true even post this election of like how Facebook refuses to sort of have even a, a direct purview on fake news and taken small steps into like trying to flag content or allow users to flag content, but they actually don't have a guide or opinion on like how do you, what are specific examples to look at of fake news, and I don't think that they'll do that. Um, with any any of these phrases, or like, or rather, I don't think that they'll actually go forward and say like, how do we inform participants on our platforms of like what is a digital hate crime? One, there isn't any kind of law specifically right now around what is a digital hate crime, but two, Facebook uh, will not have an opinion on that. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's still it's a macro level issue, right? It's totally. an issue coming from the companies yeah. that are providing this content. Yeah, it's not it's, an issue for the end user. It's, I mean, it's like. It's a multi-pronged issue. It's an issue that in which like they create the digital space and provide new tools for user agency inside of those spaces. Yeah. Cool. This part that says the left has yet to be determined is constantly mm -hmm. in flux. Do you mean that more as a provocation or is that more of a, a claim? It's a mixture of, of both. I think. What was the Oh, oh it, it says the left has yet to be determined and it's constantly in flux. Kind of yeah. juxtaposed with the right. Mm -hmm. So I was curious if that's more of a provocation or if that's like a oh. empirical kind of claim about left discourse. Or like it's a, it's a mixture of both. It's coming out of like how what is the general left has sort of seemed to be in shambles post with um, the loss of Hillary as well as like the issues that the DNC has created around like what is um, like liberal ideology with a more I think establishing space of like democratic socialism post this election. Yeah, it made me kind of think like, what would the, I don't mean I hate to create a dichotomy, but what, what would the dichotomy be of that second second post or the second slide? Right. I'm going to write that. Okay, I'll, I'll grab a marker. <laughs> Well, would we like to invite people to write, or are we? Yeah. yeah. I've got my first one. Just getting one. You actually got one. You got one. Yeah. Once you talk, you got to write. Yeah, that's right. Anybody's not writing? You want to help change the chairs? We're going to do both right here. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Trolls you. 